Hello and welcome to today's Start Here Education and Outreach webinar series. My name is Eugenie Jones Lafridge. I am DCD Marketing and Communications Program Coordinator and Project Manager of the Start Here Initiative. Uh, thank you so much for being here. We're excited to share information with you. But before we get started, I'd like to introduce my fellow panelists. First, DCD Assistant Director David Kinley. Hello. And also subject matter expert and DSE engineer, Candy Vickery. Hello all. So uh, David and Candy are going to be here today, uh, not only as panelists, but as our subject matter experts to delve into the content of what we're presenting today. But also very thankful that our other team members are here to facilitate this effort. First, Permit Services, Supervisor Veronica Basson, and also Permit Services Marketing Communications Technician Alicia Adler. Hey everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks so much for you all being here today. Um, I would say getting out of the office, but technically you're still in the office. <laughs> but you're deviating from your normal duties to be here for this, and I'm thankful that you are. Um, I want to start by giving a little explanation about the Start Here project. Uh, this is a project that we launched uh, a week ago and part of the initiative behind it is to provide education and information resources to the clients that we serve. So today's topic is going to be building site plans and I'd like to share my screen with you to share uh, the PowerPoint presentation that's gonna walk us through um, this presentation today. So everybody seeing this okay? It's there. It's there, okay, good. So this very excited person saying, I got this, is exactly where we love to see our customers be and, and is basically the backdrop to the Start Here project. Uh, we are going to present a content today on that at, at a basic level, we'll share information about land use and building development for uh, our clients who will at some point, either now or in the future, are submitting permits to DCD for their land use and building development projects. We'll present content and then we will shift over to questions um, about the content toward the end. Um, to give you a heads up about additional webinars beyond today's content, building site development, we also have next month coming up, Clearing Timber Harvest, uh, August will be critical areas, September, stormwater, and then we have Kissup County Code coming up in October, before you buy or build feasibility in November, and then in December, we'll talk about permits and Kissup County Code once again. So we are videotaping this presentation today, and it will be available on our website for you to access in the future or, or to share with other people in the future. And the content will also be um, additionally, we'll offer brochures that go into a deeper dive on these various topics, all for the purpose of helping beginners who are new to land use and building development get a better handle on how to be successful in their project. What we're going to talk about in today's session is building site plan submittal standards, what the submittal approval process looks like, the requirements checklist, which is a great tool when you are pulling together a building site plan. And we're going to actually review an actual building site plan. So we'll open up to your questions after we've addressed this content. We ask that your questions be relevant to the topic because I know it's, it's tempting to delve into your individual projects, but we wanna stay on point for the purpose of everybody that's here today to learn as much as they can about the building site plan process. To get us started, uh, Candy, Vickery is going to now talk about what a building site plan actually is. Yes, thanks, Eugenie. So welcome, everyone. Um, and I suppose a foremost question in everyone's mind is just what in the world is a building site plan? A building site plan is a drawing to a specified scale um, that uh, is really a picture of your project. 
and it um, shows how your construction project relates to your boundary lines and to existing land features such as so perhaps steep slopes or wetlands. Um, the building site plan serves a twofold purpose. Uh, one, it assures that we are reviewing to proper standards and that we are issuing permits that comply with uh, relevant codes and, and laws. And secondly, it provides a plan to your contractors um, for the site work part of your permit. Um, so uh, there are many pieces to the puzzle of, of a building permit and a building site plan. Uh, so the, the site plan gives your contractor guidance and helps to show how all the pieces of this puzzle fit together properly. You can think of it this way. The building site plan guides the site work just as your building construction plans guide the, uh, how your building is constructed. So uh, first off, um, an endeavor like creating a building site plan uh, does need some research um, and planning. Um, and as you research, you will find that research is gonna be one of your best friends at this stage of the game. Uh, the research will help you discover any potential issues that may affect um, how your building site plan comes together, or that may need attention during the permitting process. Uh, it may, you may also discover through your research that due to some land features of your property, uh, you may need some additional professional services or additional permits. Uh, if that's the case, this can impact your project's review timeline pretty significantly. Um, so it's really good to find out these things very early in the process at this research stage. Um, so you can help fit all this into your project timeline. Thank you, Candy. Uh, David is going to jump in here and talk about the next steps to submittal. Great, thank you, Eugenie. Uh, you know, as, as both Eugenie and, and Candy uh, introduced, the topic. Uh, it's really important to to get the information up front, and and uh, the this whole campaign is about start here. Uh, we we're really wanting people to consult with uh, DCD prior to getting too far down the road of uh, submitting a permit. Uh, some of our research has shown that uh, seventeen percent of people have uh, reached out to DCD prior to applying for their permit, and um, what what that does is there's surprises along the way, right? Where um, maybe somebody didn't realize that if they were clearing uh, over a certain threshold that they would trigger a site development activity permit in addition to their, um, their building permit, in which case the building permit review process has begun already and then our reviewers have to inform them, no, you also need a site development activity permit, which is going to just add more time at costs and um, you know extend out the project for it, it could be months right uh, that that it adds to the project. So uh, the hope uh, is that in through this process um, of doing feasibility studies that people are reaching out to DCD and that we're able to provide them with feedback. So steps to submittal for a site plan research as Candy indicated is very, very important. So we wanna research the feasibility of our projects. Um, and we have some resources. If you click on the chat, um, you will see uh, some, some links to some resources uh, out there. These include um, Assessor's uh, website. Uh, I think the first one is DCD's website, which has all these great links to different resources that you can um, go to for uh, information that you can incorporate into um, your site plan process. So um, they're going to, those resources will, will provide information that's going to really help you uh, with a suitable application for your, your parcel. Um, the next step is uh, to consider things that DCD does not 
actually review, and that is uh, septic and well design. A lot of places in the county, you're going to find that you're going to be either on a community or a municipal water source, or you're going to be on, on a sewer. But for those properties that aren't in more rural areas, then septic and well design is going to be something that you need to discuss with Kitsap Public Health District. We have a really good working relationship with Kitsap Public Health District and, and uh, work well. Uh, last year, we uh, helped revamp this whole site plan process with the health district um, to make things a little more clear, a little more concise um, uh, as compared to what they have been in the past. So um, prop for properties that are served by wells and septic, they have to consult with the health district. And um, there's a little bit of a a crossover there because there's different setback requirements that they have to like driveways, uh, structures, um, and even some critical areas that uh, need to be addressed uh, where a septic system can and can't go or a well can and can't go. So um, very important to, to consult with them as well. Uh, the next step would be to draft a preliminary site plan. Uh, this is a suggestion, it's not a requirement, but a pre preliminary site plan uh, defined as a rough draft. So um, we're just we're just planning things out. I know as I plan things out, I kind of move things around and want to see what works best, what kind of uh, design or flow to the to the project do I want to have. In addition to that, we have all these requirements uh, for critical areas such as steep slopes or wetlands, uh, shoreline. There's all kinds of different considerations you need to take into into account. And factor into your project. And so uh, a rough draft is a really good way to do that. And then you can um, consult with DCD on those things as well as the health district, see if those things are, if the, the rough draft is going to be applicable, uh, if, if there's things that need to be moved uh, on that site plan. Um, a rough draft is something you can do yourself. Uh, you can also have uh, somebody draft that for you, a design professional, um, some people have used uh, septic designs in the past to, to kind of rough, rough out where things are going to go. Um, so after a rough draft, your next step is, uh, like I said, to review that with the DCD team. Uh, we've got many different resources uh, and, and means of doing that. First is uh, live chat. Uh, not necessarily going to be sharing documents through live chat, but you can uh, do a live chat, uh, which is available on our website. Um, to be able to uh, communicate back and forth with a permit tech or a, uh, 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 an environmental planner. We've got different uh, disciplines that are available during that live chat. We also have uh, preliminary meetings that you can, uh, you can schedule. You can, do, um, you can come into DCD and do a 15 minute uh, uh, free consultation with either a permit tech or a uh, environmental planner or a building uh, reviewer. Um, you can also do an hourly uh, staff consultation, which is a half hour meeting that is a paid meeting that uh, you get all the various disciplines put together on that. Uh, and then hourly meetings are also another option where you can, if you only have environmental concerns, you can go to a, you can schedule an environmental planner, or if you only have building concerns, you can schedule a building reviewer, um, different disciplines. You can choose who, who you would like to speak to in those times. It's for more efficiency. Uh, the next step, select who's gonna create your site plan. Is that gonna be you? Is that gonna be a, a design professional? Uh, scope, the complexity of the project, other features of, of your property are going to uh, play into whether or not that's something that you wanna tackle yourself or if you need to hire a design professional. In some cases, we're going to require that a design professional do the design work on a site plan. Uh, largely that is due to stormwater or other in, in, uh, engineered systems that might, need, might be uh, triggered based on the size and complexity of your project. Um, fine, uh, the next step is to submit your final plan uh, to DCD. This is gonna be in conjunction with all of your other um, uh, construction documents. So if you're building a single family home, you'll wanna make sure you've got your architectural and structural all your stormwater documentation in place, but this is the point at which your site plan would be done, ready for submittal. Um, and uh, 
all your pro different professional consultations, whether that be a wetland mitigation report or something like that would also be included in final documents. But in this case, we've got the site plan ready for submittal. Thank you, David. So the next segment, we're going to talk about the actual site plan submittal, what the document itself looks like and what you need to have contained in that. Candy, you wanna step in here? Yes, thanks Eugenie. Uh, site plan submittal. Well, as David touched on a bit, um, there are several formats that can serve as the building site plan. Um, uh, as he mentioned, there are certain uh, circumstances that require the uh, site plan be prepared by a professional. Um, and if that is the case, uh, that is the case and uh, it would be submitted as a digital drawing. Uh, you may also self-prepare a plan. It can be a hand-drawn plan by you um, or a copy of the septic design plan. And whichever format you choose for your building site plan, it does need to include all of the information that's required by the DCD building site plan requirements checklist. And we'll be going over that in a few moments. Uh, submittal standards for a building site plan have, have been established. Uh, they are required to be drawn to a specified scale uh, on paper no smaller than eight and a half by 11. Um, the standard scales do vary depending on the size of your property. Um, and you can see that on, on the slide Eugenie has here. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is if your parcel is larger than two and a half acres or is irregularly shaped or needs to be drawn at a scale of uh, one inch equals 100 feet or greater, um, we would also then require that the um, site plan include an inset plan of the uh, construction area, the area of the structures and associated uh, features. Um, additional submittal standards are outlined in the building site requirements checklist. Um, and this is designed as a tool for you to help, uh, help assure yourself that you are including all the information needed for us to review and approve your permit. The, um, so uh, why do we have submittal standards? The main reason we have found for um, permit processing delays uh, relate to submittal standards. And they are that there are just missing documents, required documents that were not submitted or incorrect or inconsistent information within uh, the permit submittal documents or just something that is required to be on the site plan, but was simply omitted. Um, now this can cause significant delays in, in permit processing, and we want to catch this early on. We don't want your permit to be under full review and have this be discovered then. Um, particularly if a professional is required uh, for a particular item, you don't wanna find out late in the game that that's the case. So the use of the building site plan checklist uh, will be very helpful in assuring you submit all we need to approve your permit. So here's a, a quick view of the building site plan requirements checklist. As I said, it's um, broken into some categories and you can use these columns on the left to indicate uh, that you have shown the item on the site plan or that it's not applicable. That's really gonna help you keep track of, of all the myriad things that we like to see on a site plan. This uh, first section is general information, just some information about your property and who prepares the site plan. Project information uh, shows on your site plan specific info about your project that this permit is, is dealing with. Uh, then there's the utilities section uh, that tells you what needs to show on the site plan regarding utilities. 
uh, your septic system, water, other utilities. Uh, stormwater information also needs to appear on the site plan. Uh, we need to see existing as well as proposed uh, stormwater features. Um, and uh, another important consideration in the world of stormwater is the amount of hard surface area. So the location and dimensions of those types of areas. Critical areas uh, kind of goes back to your very first research discussion. Um, you will find critical areas uh, during your research, and this section tells you what needs to show on the site plan regarding that. Thank you, Candy. Oh, one more shoreline. Oh, yes, <laughs> shorelines. Shorelines are considered a critical area, although they do have some additional special considerations and perhaps restrictions of what can occur within shoreline uh, areas and their buffers. So this section uh, guides you as to what to show on the site plan for that. Thank you, Candy. Thanks, Eugene. So we're going to see what an example of a site plan right now. David is going to talk us through this. Actually, you have a better one in mind. Here we go. Here we go. So as part of the, uh, the brochure that we've put together regarding site plans, we've put an example site plan in here. And you can see on this that uh, this is, this is a, uh, a parcel that has most every uh, thing that we would be concerned about. Um, the, you know, this is a waterfront property. And so it's got the, the various features of uh, the, the shoreline requirements on there, including some buffers. There's a top and toe of slope shown on here. Those are very important. One thing we didn't necessarily touch on, but in our zoning code, we have setback requirements for uh, where um, buildings can't be within certain distances of the sides of the property, uh, the front yard, rear yard, setbacks, and in this case, a setback from top of slope. Uh, all this is shown on here. Um, you've got a location for your, your septic tank and septic systems. You've got, uh, you can see an eye pit or an infiltration pit on here. Um, it, it shows the driveways. Um, these are all things we need to, in, in order to look at impervious surfaces and those types of things. So there's a, a lot that goes on to site plan and what you, uh, what you would see a lot of times is a lot of information, a small amount of space. It's very, very important that as these site plans are put together, that it's clear and legible and that we understand all the markings that are on there. So as you can see on the right-hand side, it's got a bit of a key there. The, the clearing limits are clouded. It shows the drainage flow arrows, the contour lines, those types of things so that we can determine, we can decipher what it is you're trying to communicate to us in regards to your site plan. So, this is a this is a, a rough draft of a of a example site plan. It's kind of what we're looking for. Everything we do now at DCD is electronic uh, in terms of submittals. Um, that doesn't mean it can't be hand drawn. It just needs to be scanned and uh, converted to a PDF and then uploaded for for um, review. So, um, like I said, this is an example. There's lots of different uh, factors and features of property that are not included in the site plan, but all the things that we went through in the checklist would need to be addressed if it's applicable to your property. Um, one more thing I wanted to, to touch on is uh, Candy mentioned it, like in terms of the various codes that we would uh, be, uh, codes and laws that we review to, there's a, there's a lot of them, right? And so that's why the, sometimes the complexity uh, is it's pretty um, it's up there right in terms of um, of what we need to see and uh, that in those ways a design professional if not drawing it can sometimes be consulted on these these items uh, specifically we're talking about building code uh, we're talking about fire code we're talking about zoning environmental shoreline even floodplain for uh, some of those areas that are in the FEMA flood zones uh, wetlands and stormwater, these are all things that we need to be addressed. And they, there's a complexity in each one of those. The code books are not thin, right? They, they, I, I always say they're, they're written by the pound and uh, <laughs> there's lots of, lots of weight to those uh, code books out there. And it seems like we, we get more, yeah. more uh, as the years go by. So complexity is up there. 
doesn't mean it's insurmountable and not able, you're not able to do it yourself for, um, for specific projects. But um, if you follow the, some of the resources that we've provided, uh, it's our goal to make you successful in your application. Absolutely. Thank you, David. And thank you, Candy, uh, for sharing that information with us. Uh, we'd like to open it up to your questions now. Uh, David and Candy are going to um, look through those and we'll answer those live. Um, are we able to view the Q&A box? Yeah, so I uh, first one there is, is, do most people hire a professional to help create the building site plan? Um, I would, I would say probably most, uh, that doesn't mean that all do, or, uh, it, it, it's probably somewhere in the, the 60% range. Uh, if it depends on, on what time, <laughs> what, uh, what code cycle, what time of year we're talking about as well. There's a lot of factors as to who, uh, who, who would attempt to do their own. Um, so there's a, like I said, there's a lot of complexity to it and it really depends on what your project is. Uh, if you're, if you're building a garage, um, that might be something you tackle yourself. It's a detached garage and, you know, you can, uh, you can figure that out fairly simply with that said, um, you know, area parcels with lots of wetlands or critical areas, steep slopes that adds a factor of complexity. So I see Jonathan is asking, uh, regarding septic or city water. So public septic and water, is there a place to see if our property is on the infrastructure expansion plan? Um, as far as I know, those sorts of plans are kept by the individual um, utility purveyors. So whoever the septic uh, uh, sanitary sewage district is or water district would have more information in that regard. Thank you, Candy. Yeah, I see another one here. Um, is there, uh, is there a fee for the hourly meeting? Does that fee apply to your permit as long as it is submitted within six months of the, of the meeting? Uh, so I'll let Veronica correct me if I, if I stray out of, out of uh, line on this one. Um, but the, um, the, the staff consultation uh, does uh, get credited back to your uh, permit fee. Uh, the hourly meeting, I believe, where you're just meeting with like one professional or two, one or one reviewer or two reviewers, I do not believe that is credited back to your, your permit. Veronica, is there, am I on, on par with that? Yeah, definitely. Staff okay. council, more for that general overview direction. Um, so you get the credit towards the new application hourly rate, just like you described more for very specific in-depth code dives, interpretations, things like that. Um, so that one is not necessarily credited to a new application. Thank you. Uh, okay, um, I see someone asking if there are design challenges or other challenges caused by the project. May we email a reviewer to discuss the challenges to fix the issue prior to full submittal? Um, uh, our preference is that you access uh, or, or contact the reviewers through the um, live chat uh, online service or the other meeting services that David went over. Um, our, our, our main focus, of course, needs to be review of permits. Um, so the, but uh, those other options that, that David went over uh, can be very helpful and gain you a lot of information. Uh, so I've got a couple here. Um, once you receive a permit for the approved building site plan, how long is the plan valid? So um, once you receive your permit from us, uh, you have 365 days to, to start the project. Uh, after each subsequent approved inspection, the, the permit is extended 180 days. So um, you, you actually have quite a bit of time uh, to keep the project alive. Uh, as long as the project is being pursued in good faith, in other words, you are actively working on it, then that extension will, will continue um, by, uh, by the inspection process. Um, and then... There's another question here. What about local fire marshal approval of fire 
of driveway driveway dimensions. Yes, so uh, for, so fire code is something that is reviewed on the site plan, uh, and access um, is for the most part required for every single family in the county. Uh, so single family homes. There is an exception in the fire code, I think, where driveways serve, served by two or fewer um, don't have to meet the full width requirement, um, but I'd need to dig into that one a little bit with the fire marshal. Um, but yes, uh, there, is a, there is a width and, um, and also a loading criteria and overhead clearance criteria uh, for those, those access, uh, fire department access, emergency vehicle access. Um, so good question. Thank you. Uh, and Andrew, who was asking about project challenges, <laughs> has another question as well. Uh, for applicants living far away, is every meeting, plan submittal, and other review requirements completed electronically slash virtually? Um, at, at this point in time, yes, we are holding virtual meetings uh, almost exclusively, although we have opened up our offices. Um, partially for some in-person stuff. Um, I don't believe there is anything during the permit processing that requires an in-person meeting. Uh, Veronica, do I have that correct? That's right. Yep, okay. there's nothing that requires in-person um, from start to finish, unless you wanna to get to the job site eventually. <laughs> um, the application process and any meetings are available virtually. So before we jump into another question, let's take a look at our website very quickly. Um, just to kind of walk people through um, This page is a new page that was just launched, Land Use and Building Development Basics. It's a part of the Start Here project. And if you're interested in learning more about additional webinars or registering for webinars, this would be the page that would allow you to do that. You can see it all. It has all the different ones listed here. Some of them are open for registration by the red links. Some aren't open for registration yet. Additionally, we're building out our, our brochure content. So I'd love to show this one to you. This is the brochure for building site plan. Um, and am I actually sharing the brochure? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Great. So um, this kind of takes you through the various, various uh, content, some of the checklists that um, Candy shared with you. You can actually use this checklist, mark it up as you see fit, print this out, use it digitally um, to keep track of where you are. And the example building site plan that David shared with you is also here too. So um, wanted to be able to, to share that with you where you can find those things. Um, also good thing to know about the website is where um, our homepage is located and what you can access there. Um, Veronica mentioned about permit services. You can access the permit services page right here on DCD's homepage. And by clicking onto permit services, you're able to access a number of additional links that would be helpful to you um, as a contractor or as a first time single family resident person building your first home. You see access to the code Kissap County code, fee schedules, partial searches, and additional information that's available here on the website. Also wanting to point out that if you're interested in meeting with members of our DCD review team, you can also access that information here too. Thanks, Eugenie. Sure. Um, do we move on to more questions here? Absolutely. Okay, so I've got a question here. Is there a list of approved or certified site uh, plan designers? Um, so the website that Eugenie was just showing you has a list of industry professionals that have conducted work in the county before. Uh, we stray away from uh, providing recommendations, I guess, is, is the way to, to front load that. Um, 
but there's a list of, of individuals who have um, provided documentation uh, in the past and successfully uh, achieved the, the permit process. Um, so hopefully that answers your question there. Um, also, I'll just move on to another one. Um, we don't have to go in person to submit building the building permit. Everything will be electronically submitted, right? Um, yes, uh, that is true. There's nothing to do in person in terms of submitting an application that is all done through our permit portal now online. Uh, I know there are some jurisdictions uh, neighboring to us that require an in-person meeting uh, for a, a permit intake. And that is, not, that is not the case in Kitsap County any, any longer. Um, and then I've got one last one here that I clicked on. Uh, will site plans assist with assessing what good foundation requirements are? Um, I would say that it's not going to, the, the, the process of uh, doing your research might, but the site plan itself will not. Um, so generally speaking, um, foundation requirements are gonna be either prescriptive or designed out of the International Residential Code or International Building Code. Um, the criteria for those um, are, are in those codes. Uh, you could also have a design professional engineer one for you. But largely what I, I think um, what I would like to address is the soil bearing capacity is something that is very, very important when you're designing your foundation. We presume that the soils in Kitsap County are capable of a 1500 PSF uh, from a prescriptive standpoint. You may have soils uh, that, um, that won't sustain that. And in that case, if we determine that, we'd wanna see some sort of ge uh, geotechnical report for those soils. So. Um, but the, that, that information isn't necessarily required on the site plan, um, but it would be through your, your engineering for your, your structure. Okay, so I see a question. Are hydric soils and wetlands treated the same? The short answer is no. And the long answer, I'm not sure I can provide. Uh, we do have our environmental reviewers um, on staff who are much more knowledgeable about hydric soils and wetlands than I am. Um, so some consultation with one of our environmental reviewers could help with that. Great, thanks Candy. I'm gonna throw in a poll question right here um, for everyone. Um, you can participate in this by, by answering, how did you learn about today's webinar? Um, on the DCD website um, by subscribing to the Gov Delivery emails, or you received a constant contact email message. So uh, please answer that question as we continue to work our way through your Q and A questions. David, do you see one there you'd like to answer? Yeah, there's um, there's one, and I apologize. I think this is. Uh follow up from a pre the previous one, one of the previous ones I answered, but is, so is there a fee for a staff consultation? Yes, there is. And, and uh, Veronica, if you don't mind, can you, can you speak to the fees regarding uh, the staff consultation versus the hourly meeting? Yes, definitely. So the staff consultation is a flat $350. That's the meeting fee. And then that full 350 is the amount that gets credited to your permit application if you apply within a year of the meeting. And then the hourly rate is by the hour. I think it's maybe even by the half hour, depending on how many staff you have attending. Um, and it's just a, here's the time they spent times our hourly rate of, I believe, um, I'd have to look at the amount, but I think it's about 130. And all those fees are listed on the website too. Yes. So if you go to that homepage, it talks about uh, scheduling with the review team, you'll be able to access the fee schedule from those links. Yeah, usually if you have time to have a staff consultation ahead of time, um, it's worth it because then you get a credit to your fees um, and uh, it can be of assistance for a lot of people. Free information. Uh, <laughs> So I see a question here, how do I find elevation on my property? Um, our parcel search mapping is a great way to do that. Uh, you will see uh, 
um, a little uh, toggle box for contours, and that will place the contours uh, over your, your parcel, and you can see what the elevation uh, is at various points in your property. Thank you, Candy. So checking our poll question here, um, well, most people, 45% of you said you find out you found out about today's topic through a Gov Delivery email. So that's good to know. If you are not a subscriber to our Gov Delivery emails, you can do that on our website. Um, there, just click on, it says subscribe to a newsletter. You just click on that link. And once you do that, it will give you options as to which topics you'd like information sent to you. If you subscribe to the topic of um, community development, for instance, you would have received an email message telling you about this particular workshop. So uh, another question here is, have you ever created a building site plan? And 67% 67, 67 of you say, yes, you did. So thank you for answering those questions. I've got a couple here that I can answer. Okay. Uh, I've got one that says, if you get your site plan or return, what is the exception for it to be reviewed again? Uh, so good question. The, um, if you get it returned with comments, then we're likely only going to re uh, review the comments that um, were made on that. So it wouldn't be like a full review, send it back through all the different reviewers, but um, it might just be an environmental comment or it could be, um, it could be a building comment. Um, for example, you know, the, uh, if uh, if your eaves uh, project into the five foot setback of the property, they have to be either fire rated or, or solid blocked. And that's a really technical example, but I mean, it could be something like that. And then only the building reviewer is going to review that. Um, so if it's returned, then, um, then really it's not a full review again. It's just going to be the applicable review that needs to happen. Um, there's another question about how long are plans good for. So again, the 365 days after issuance of permit, um, construction needs to begin. You need to have your first inspection within those 365 days. Um, that approved inspection will then uh, prolong the, the permit for another 180 days. So as long as you're, you're working through that, you should be good. Uh, and the only time you'd have to repay permit fees is if you allow that permit to expire. Um, we currently give a 30 day grace period after permit expiration that would allow you to request an extension to that. Um, that's the other, that's the other thing that could um, extend your permit. If you contact us before expiration and say, uh, I need another 180 days on my permit um, and give us, uh, the requirement is, is to uh, show that the, the project is progressing and that it's being pursued in good faith. And therefore, we would ask that you qualify why you need um, you know, that to be extended. But um, we, we typically don't deny those uh, extensions at all. So um, permit fees, I think if it's within the first um, 30 days to 100 and 80 days or is it uh, 365? I can't remember. <laughs> I have to go back and look at it. There's half the permit fee for, um, for extension. I think if it's uh, after that, it's, uh, it's the full permit fee. So really staying on top of your expiration date is, is important um, so that uh, there's no fees associated with extending that. Um, then a follow-up question on that is, uh, if, uh, if you sell the plants, the, I assume you sell the, the property and the permit and everything to somebody else, um, can the other buyer utilize that? Well, the, the answer to that is yes, you would just have to show that everything was sold and that the new owners of the property own all of the documentation, the permit and everything that was, that was part of the purchase sale of the property. So yes, you can transfer ownership of a permit. Uh, we do that. Um, uh, not super regularly, but if there's a contractor change or something like that, if the contractor purchased the permit, there has to be a, a shift of ownership back to the property owner um, before that can happen. So yes, we, we do process those with some frequency. Okay, we're winding down in our time, but we have time for a few more questions. Um, Candy, do you see one you wanna tackle? Yes. Um... 
if you know that your property has wetlands, is a wetland delineation always required, even if construction will be nowhere near the wetlands? Um, a wetland delineation is not always required. Uh, there are some factors that come into this. There's different categories of wetlands. Um, so that plays a part in that. Uh, additionally, for a single family residence, um, there is a form we have uh, called a single family wetland certification um, that can be used under certain circumstances for a single family project with wetlands. So there's a, there's a question here as well. Can we schedule with environmental specialists prior to building permit submittal if the parcel we have is a wetland? Yes, we encourage that. We would absolutely encourage you to do that consultation prior to, to permit submittal. Um, so I see someone asking, who do I consult to find out about the status of my property in terms of being a critical area and which way the stormwater drains? Um, you may view the parcel in our parcel search mapping. Uh, as I mentioned, check out all the layers there and toggle things on and off um, to see what critical areas are on your parcel, if any. As far as stormwater drainage, which, which way the, the water drains will um, be determined by the lay of the land. And that is, uh, you can see that by the contours that I mentioned earlier, clicking that contour layer on. Okay. Um, David, one last question. Yeah, I've got, um, I've got one here. It says, once the building site plan is approved, is the next step to hire an architect. And so that's great. That's gonna clarify this process for us. So uh, the building site plan is actually going to be submitted in conjunction with your architectural plans. And so it's basically, this is a snapshot of your entire project that needs to be submitted with your, your architectural and structural plans in order for us to do a full review. So the building site plan, it wouldn't be approved by itself ahead of a, a permit submittal. It is going to be part of your permit submittal. Um, the way to get uh, you know, ahead of that is what we've been describing. Uh, coming in, getting a consultation with DCD, we can lay out some different uh, uh, requirements, uh, provide a little bit of uh, guidance on that so that you're successful in your, in your permit submittal application. But that's, it's all part of the same permit process as getting a, a building permit for your home. Candy, you can jump in and an answer one last question too. We're going to loop back to Veronica and ask her to share any, uh, I don't know, hidden secrets that she can share about permit services and how people can work their way through there very successfully. So, but Candy, let's let you take a question as a final too. Good, yeah. Um, so this is not really a question. I don't know if the other uh, attendees can see these questions. Uh, but I do see that we have a wetland biologist uh, has joined us here. And um, back to the question of wetlands versus hydric soils, uh, she's provided a bit of information that may be uh -huh. helpful. Um, uh, hydric soils are an indicator of wetlands. And if you see that green mapped on your property, uh, then it may be a wetland. So, uh, so yes, and, and as I said, they are not treated the same, but it is an indicator. Great, thank you. And thank you for sharing that information. Veronica, any cue and tips for permit services you'd like to share with folks? Thanks, Eugenie. Yeah, I definitely don't have any hidden secrets, but <laughs> um, yeah, we just want everyone to know that here at DCD, especially throughout the whole department, but especially in permit services, which is the permit technicians that tend to help people get started with the application process and can sometimes help facilitate if you need help scheduling those meetings or appointments and things like that. We acknowledge permitting can be complex, especially if it's your first time. Um, we are not under any illusion that it's just as simple as filling out um, an application to update your car tabs or something like that and call it a day. But we genuinely are here to help and we like to do that. We work here, we tend to know the processes and the codes easier. And that's why we have permit technicians on live chat all day, every day, except for Friday is at noon. And um, all of the other available appointments, just like the other staff, um, 
if there's, there's just no answer too simple or too complex to help us facilitate getting to you, um, we will, we're just there to lend a hand. When we are busy, sometimes, you know, waiting for the appointment or getting a call back might take a little bit of time, but we assure you, we will get to you. And um, when we do, we will give it our best effort to make it go smoothly. And also the most important thing is to try and alleviate surprises later. So I'm really glad that this webinar did focus on research. The last thing we want is for someone to put all the time energy and resources, I mean, dollars towards an application process and find out a big surprise at that, after that point. So um, if you are doing it yourself, there will be a little bit of research involved, um, but hopefully it'll pay off by preventing any surprises that are, were not anticipated. Thank you, Veronica. And thank you, David Kinley, our assistant director, and thank you, Candy Vickery, for being our subject matter expert as a DSC engineer today. We want to remind folks that Start Here is a new education and outreach program launched by DCD, and it is explicitly related to feedback that we received from our customers that said, we want to see more content-rich information on our website, on your website, uh, for us to access. And we want to know more about the processes that are involved in our applying for permits. So Start Here is an education and outreach program to do just that. When we say start here, we're saying start with education and information, because if you start there, you start from an informed perspective and you are guaranteed to have greater success than moving down the line of a permit process and finding out something later that a little bit of research and a provision of information could have steered you in a different direction. So please visit our website for greater details, uh, access our brochures, plan to attend upcoming webinars. If you can't make the date, don't worry. We will post a link on that same page and we'll give you access to watch them later. If you are an industry representative and you provide services to the same clients that we do, we're inviting you to be communication ambassadors with DCD. And what that would entail is that you just simply provide our start here link on your website that brings people back to that education and information page that gives them access to webinars and brochures and other content pertinent to their permit process. And in exchange, we will reciprocate. We will provide a link to your webpage that says you are a communication ambassador and someone who provides services in this community. We stop short of endorsing anyone because our legal department says, no, 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 you cannot do that. But we can say, that this is someone who is working with us to make sure our residents in Kissack County are getting the information they need to be successful in their land use and building development projects. So we thank you again for being here today. My name is Eugenie jones Lafridge. I invite you to get inside our website and learn as much as you possibly can. And thank you again for joining us today. Thank you.